Hi everyone, welcome back to my strategy show. For those of you who are new here, this is our weekly show on Chess24 about the middle game. We learn plans, ideas, patterns that you can apply in certain type of, type, types of positions. We started with the hanging pawns, so all of my students are supposed to be experts on the hanging pawns. Please tell me guys that you are already experts on the hanging pawns. And now we are dealing with the isolated pawn. We've learned how to break through with d5 and also about the queen and rook lift via the third rank. But before we start with today's lesson, I need to tell you about why can't they, because I've just come home. Look what I've got, so many stuffs. I've got all these kind of things. This is my player's card. I've got the registration card. It actually says that I'm from Spain. I do live in Spain, but uh, I'm Hungarian. So I didn't know that I changed nationality during the tournament, but then it was corrected to Hungarian. So I'm Hungarian. Uh, this is a cute little notebook where you can write your games with the Tata Steel chess pen. And also the program, of course, you can see like a brief introduction on the tournament, when is what, the champion of the Masters, Anirgiri, all the other Masters, Challengers, really nice event. I'm, I'm highly recommending it to everybody that you take part of the Vikings tournament at least once in your life because you definitely need to experience this how is it when it's a town only about chess because for half a month in Vikings Day every January everything is about chess you go to a cafe there's a chess board you go to a restaurant people play chess you go to a pub people play chess you go to the news agent people talk about chess you just you see chess pieces everywhere chess players everywhere you can meet your favorite players like look what i've got isn't it cool that you can get so many autographs you can meet these top players take photos with them see their games live and at the same time you can play games as well because there's there's a tournament for everybody you can play the weekends three round tournaments you can play weekdays three round tournaments or the long tournament where i took part that's a nine round event quite long for me it didn't go very well but if you want to know more about my tournament and my impressions on Waikansi, we did some vlogs with Sopico on the Tata Steel Chess Tournament. So either here on the show's page or on YouTube, you can find them under video postcard from Miss Strategy. And also, let me see what else we've got here. The Miss Strategy, Miss Strategy and Miss, Miss Tactics play each other. That was fun when we had to play, play each other with Sopico. And there's also the Miss Strategy and Miss Tactics go to the beach. <laughs> that was our free day. And there will be also a vlog coming up on the closing ceremony. So stay tuned. Uh, and we also visited a chess shop. So lots of stuff coming up there. Check our vlogs, see the impressions on Why Can't They, and make sure you take part of the event. I already can tell you the date. It's from the 13th till the 29th of January, 2017. Just write it down. Why Can't They, Tata Steel Chess Tournament from the 13th to the 29th of January, 2017. And that's all about the publicity for Tata Steel Chess. It is not any planned advertisement. I just simply love the event. So I really hope that you will visit it once at least in your life. And if we are already talking about Tata Steel, let's begin our lesson with a game from the Tata Steel Chess tournament, because of course I was following the games of the masters and the challengers and i was right i really wanted to find a good example on the isolated pawn since this is our topic so i thought that would be really cool if we had a model game from waikansi and i did find one there were quite well no, i wouldn't say quite many there were a few games on the isolated pawn topic it's not like the the most common in the best games in among the best players games i would say but there are some games with the isolated pawn, and I chose the game between, let me bring up the board, actually. We have a game by Erwin Lemmy against Daniel Savian. We're going to be, once again, playing with the white pieces with the isolated pawn, so we will attack, we will be very aggressive, taking the initiative, trying to make the opponent's king, all that stuff. And as usual, whenever I stop, whenever I ask a question, I do want you to think. So this is not just a show 
for entertainment. We are here to work and I need you to make an effort. I need, need you to think. So even if you don't get the right answer, please try to figure it out. So once you have thought about the position, you will understand more when we discuss the solution together. I know I'm saying it all the time, but this is my methodology. I want you to learn from these shows. So please think and have fun. Let's begin with this game. I hope that you can all hear me and see me. Uh, and thank you for confirming in the chat that you are experts on the hanging pose. Mission accomplished, at least about the hanging pose. Isolated bones are quite a tough topic. Um, we've already had two sessions. This is our third one. And we will have a few more because it's not so easy to understand how to play with and against this weird pawn that is in the center alone. So it has advantages and disadvantages. We discussed it already. Let's see this example. D4, knight of six. As you know, we normally help you see the board. Just let me, let me double check it. Yeah, you're, you're supposed to be seeing the board. That's good. You know that I'm not an IT genius. Sometimes I click here and there and then it disappears. But I hope that right now you are seeing the board and the moves. So this is a queen's gambit accepted. And it's going to be a variation where white sacrifices a pawn for the initiative. We haven't seen this line yet. And since this is not an opening session, we will not discuss it in detail. All I can tell you is that accepting the second pawn is not very recommendable. Bishop takes c3 is quite dangerous for black after rook b1. For instance, in this position, castle would be already a mistake because rook b3, bishop a5, and knight g5, white's attack is just extremely strong. The rook is coming to h3, the queen to h5. All that we have learned, but very, very quickly since white has sacrificed two pawns and he has a lot more developed pieces than black. So, of course, black doesn't want that second pawn. He says that one pawn up is good enough. Then he will develop his pieces and try to survive. Knight e5, this is, of course, where we want to have our knight. And after castle, queen g4, this is all theory. White wants to go bishop h6. This is more than clear. Bishop f6, bishop a3. So now we have that diagonal for a bishop. And actually here they repeated moves. So if white wants, he can make a draw. But of course, Erwin didn't want to make a draw. He just repeated once. And then he went bishop f4. And c5, rook a d1. This is all standard. Now we're going to have our isolated pawn on the board. And this is already a moment for you to think. We have a very nice queen on g4, the knight on e5, the bishops very well placed on f4 and c4 and the rook on d1. So what shall we do here? How to continue? And now a weird silence will come from my part because I need to wait for you to receive the message first. There's a slight delay between the recording and the moment when you see it. So I should be just, yeah, I should shut up and just wait. What would you play here with white? There are more good moves, so I think you will definitely guess one of them. I don't know if the move of Erwin or another one, but you will certainly guess the move. Very good, very, very, very good. So many of you have said already rook d3 and bringing the rook through the third rank. This is what we've learned before, isn't it? I'm so happy that you remember this plan and you can apply it. So that means that my shows were useful, at least a bit, I hope. Rook d3, that's the right plan. We could play rook fe1 as well, of course, but if we, if we play rook d3 first, we have the option of bringing that rook to the other rook to d1. So if you play rook f e1, then you already decided placing this rook on the e5. And after rook d3, you have the option of placing it either on e1 or on d1. So let's go rook d3. That was the move in the game. 
And here it's getting dangerous already. If, for instance, black plays like 95, which is tempting. You think that you are threatening to win a piece by capturing on e5 and on c4. Well, not immediately, but this kind of idea, like bishop takes e5, bishop e5, threatening mate on g7, but black could try to play f6, well, bishop e6 first. Not really, but anyway, <laughs> black wants to exchange pieces, so knight c4 or bishop e5, that kind of ideas. The point is that after rook h3, white even doesn't care about any hanging pieces. So if black goes knight takes c4, which I need to show you and I cannot find it because it's all in these lines. Oh my, I don't like when I cannot click where I want. So let's go first with bishop e5. I'm sorry. We have to check it first. Bishop e5, bishop e5, f6. And here we could take on e6, but that's not the best move. After bishop e6, queen e6, rook f7, and black is holding on. This is no mate, there's no winning move. So let's not, let's not do this. We are a pawn down, so winning back the pawn is not a big deal. It doesn't mean that then we will be winning. No, we want much more than winning back the pawn. So after f6, and this is what I was trying to explain before blindfold, that now the c4 bishop is hanging, the e5 bishop is hanging too. So is it that we are either exchanging everything on e6 or we are losing a piece? Mm, no, not really, because there's a very good move for white in this position, and I'm sure that you can find it. Let's see, let's see who's first. I'll take my team in the meantime. Bishop d3, very good. The bishop is hanging. And, well, we cannot move both bishops at the same time, but let's move this one, this guy, attacking the h7 square. So even if black captures our bishop on e5, we're gonna go bishop or rook takes h7, actually. You can, you can pick because both are good. Let's show the rook takes. We are threatening mating one, queen takes g7. So after queen of six, how to proceed? How can we how can we continue the attack? Because g7 is protected, we don't have any checks. Uh, it's nice to have a rook on h7 supported by the bishop on d3, but we need something more. We are a piece down, so it would be nice to give mate unless we want to resign with a piece down. So how to proceed? How to continue the attack? Very good. You guys are so quick and you always get the right move. Queen h5. Of course, we want to place the queen on h5. And now, once again, we are threatening mating one. Isn't that cool to threaten mating one? So what happens after g6? Because that's the way black can protect the aj square. What shall we do now? We don't have rook aj. And that queen is hanging on h5. So after g6, we should definitely play, we should go, what shall we play? I'm not sure that we want to exchange queens. Okay, actually, I'm pretty sure that we don't want to exchange queens. So don't play moves like d takes e5 because you do want to keep your queen and give mate to the opponent. We are a piece down, remember that. So any move that implies exchanging queens like playing d takes e5 or rook h6 are not good because we don't want to swap queens. Bishop g6, of course, very good. That was a simple move, but still you need to see that and you need to have it clear in your mind that whenever you attack, you don't want to exchange queens, especially when you are material down. So if we exchange queens here in this position, then who will give mate? 
we will simply resign because we have a piece down. So never, we never exchange queens when we have material down and when we are attacking, we wanna give mate. Bishop takes g6, of course. And now after knight c6, for instance, what can we do with white? We have three very strong attacking pieces, but we need to find a way to coordinate them and to give mate. So what's the best move here? Actually, what are the best moves? Because there are more good ones, but with the same idea. Remember that the h8 square is protected, so we don't want to go rook h8 because after queen takes h8, that's a rook and the piece down and no mate. So let's not do that. Let's just simply play. We play, what shall we play? <laughs> Some of you have said it already. Where is the square where we could give mate? If we could just make one of our pieces disappear, the square would be, the square would be h7, of course. So we need to free the h7 square for the queen and then it would be made. And the way to do it is by moving the rook. But if we go rook f7, as some of you have said it, then rook takes f7, protects the a7 square. So actually, like anywhere but not f7 or e7, we can go rook d7, rook c7, rook takes b7. Any of those moves are good because all we want is to free the a7 square and give mate there with the queen. So for instance, rook c7. And now... I think there's no way that black can protect the a7 square unless he sacrifices his queen with, with queen g7. If he doesn't want to give up the queen, he should go rook d8. But after this, I'm sure that all of you see that this is not only winning the queen, but once again, we give mate. So how did we do all this? It was because the opponent played, well, not in the game, but we were just discussing this knight a5 move which looks like black is threatening to capture a few pieces even in some positions he would win a piece but after rook h3 white's attack is so strong that it doesn't matter that our pieces are hanging and if bishop e5 bishop e5 and after f6 bishop d3 was a very good move and now finally i can click on knight c4 which was the other option what would you play here with white. If knight takes c4, we've just played rook h3, and if, if the opponent goes knight c4 instead of bishop e5, how would you continue? I think I'm going to put my Tata stuffs away and also my new in chess magazines before I put my chest 24 mug on them that wouldn't be that wouldn't be very nice so I'll just bring the mug here mouse here and wait for your answers what shall we do here queen h5 of course who cares about that knight on c4 and who cares that it has just captured our bishop we want to give mate so the mate is on the king side, not on the queen side. Nobody cares about the knight on c4. It's not protecting the king. Queen h5, and after h6, once again, you've got to guess the move and find a way to continue the attack because we are still a piece down. Bishop takes h6, very, very good. Bishop h6, well, either black captures on h6 or we will take on g7 too, but we will definitely open the h file and that's what we wanted. We want to give mate on h7 once again. And now the point is that even though black can go rook e8 and the hj square is protected, but queen h7 and queen takes f7 is made anyway. So in this position, we are winning because we not only have the queen and the rook on the h5, but we also have this very powerful central knight on e5. 
So those three pieces win the game because there are no defenders, the H and the G files are open, and black, black skin cannot hide anywhere. I think I wanted to show you, show you one more line after, if I can find it actually. <laughs> Instead of knight c4, I also wanted to show you, where is it, where is it, where are you, g6. Yeah, that's, that's another move. So we have seen rook h3, bishop e5, knight takes c4, and now g6. How would you continue here? We are not winning immediately, but we should prepare our finishing attack on the king side. Where's the square where we could crush black's defense? Where's the square where we should hit? And with which pieces? Let's see if you can answer that question. Bishop d3, very, very good. Of course, we need that bishop in some positions. It doesn't mean that we will give it up all the time or let it exchanged, be exchanged. So bishop d3 and our threat is obviously something on g6. We're going to capture on g6 if the opponent lets us and I think he cannot really prevent it. What if he goes queen takes d4? Seems like now he's threatening bishop e5 and our pieces will be hanging pinned. What can we do here? There are more good moves in this position, so I'm sure that you will guess it. Of course, we can calculate already capturing on g6, but whenever you can bring a new piece to the attack, it's even better. So let's make sure that first we have as many attacking pieces as possible, and if we can bring one more piece to the attack with a tempo, that's, that's really cool. So let's try to do that. How to bring one more piece to the attack with a tempo or with threatening something very, very, very big. Let's see, <laughs> oh, you all want to take on g6, which is of course something that we should consider. But before we capture on g6, let's just bring this rook to d1. And now you see that I colored already everything. All the white pieces are great. All the white pieces are active. They are all attacking. So we will win this game because we have so many good pieces. By black lacks development, he's got this rook on a8, the bishop on c8, the knight on e5. So those pieces are not playing, they, those pieces are not defending black's king. And we are badly threatening to capture on g6. Black cannot avoid it, the queen will be hanging on d4, so the queen has to move. And after queen b6, now you can play what you wanted. <laughs> you can either play that or another sacrifice. I think it depends on your taste. Of course, you should calculate before you sacrifice all your pieces, but once you make sure that your calculation is correct, you can play the move that is. Which one do you prefer? Where shall we sacrifice? On g6, on h7. On g6, we can capture with two pieces. Well, not, let's not start with the queen, but knight or bishop. And also, rook takes h7 is a very good move. So all those moves are winning. Very well done. All of you who said rook takes h7 or knight takes g6 or bishop, even bishop takes g6. But perhaps I prefer rook takes h7. It's a very, very pretty move. And I'll show you why it's winning. Now, after knight takes g6, we have so many threats in the air. We can capture with a double check, double discover check. Knight takes f8, we also have queen h5. There's mates in a few moves in every different, in any different line. So after f takes, of course, you see that it's mate on h7. What about um, here? You can also go knight f7, that's another nice move because after rook f7, well, it's gonna be mate anyway. It's a bit longer, but it's still nice. And also, if after knight f7, rook g8, then we have this beautiful check. And here, after queen takes f6, once again, black cannot do anything. So in many, many lines, white is winning. 
also knight takes g6 was a good move after f takes bishop takes h takes queen takes <laughs> bishop g7 and now actually this is a more complicated variation so if you wanted to play knight takes g6 you gotta tell me how will we give mate here because queen h7 is not a mate the king can escape or at least it seems like it's escaping what happens after king f7 what do we have here how can we attack we are already two pieces down so we better give mate somehow let's see how if we go queen h5 check the king can go back to g8 so that means that we haven't achieved anything let's try to find something else we don't want the king to go back we don't want to make a draw we want to win the game so it's not something that is so easy to spot because we are not giving a check and we are not threatening anything directly just it's going to be a huge threat afterwards and once you find the move i think you will understand me as some of you have said it already congratulations everyone who said rook to f3 that's the best move here because after rook f3 we are threatening with a discovered check that is just horribly strong it doesn't matter if it's bishop e5 bishop h6 bishop c7 any bishop move is winning here and the king cannot escape because after king e8 we simply give a check and now bishop e5 we are threatening to capture on f7 anyway it cannot be protected and you know that a pinned piece is not protecting anything so even after bishop f6 rook, rook f6 is still hanging the rook is still hanging on f7 and we're gonna give mate so this was more complicated i think knight g6 and to see that after these checks bishop g7 queen h7 here rook f3 is not an easy move to see especially since you need to see it before you sacrifice on g6 so sir i'm just saying that if you see like you can capture on g6 and on h7 try to find the one that is uh, more simple i think rook takes h7 is a lot more simple because here after knight takes g6 it's quite obvious that black skin cannot hide anywhere and we are threatening with all sorts of checks and mates so the more simple the better you don't have to find the, the line that sacrifices the more number of pieces it doesn't have to be with a queen sacrifice it doesn't have to go for a beauty price just make sure that if you sacrifice it will work and that's why the more simple the calculation the better in this case this was easier to calculate so rook takes h7 i think is the best move because it's more practical but okay all this was about this knight a5 move black trying to exchange pieces trying to threaten bishop e5 but this is not what happened in the game because Stevian realized that there could be a lot of trouble after rook h3 so he goes g6 and now you need to tell me why should we not go rook h3 in this position rook h3 is not a good move unfortunately we wish it was a good move but no it's not a good move here And I'll wait for your answers, as usual. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Why not rook h3 here? I'll put it on the board, actually. Why not? Rook h3. And here, black could play. Yes, to the question if, if this is live it is live because i've come back home from Vikings day i am here with you guys this is half past six okay 6 34 actually in spain i don't know what's the time in your country but it's half past six here and this is going live so please talk to me in the chat i'm sitting here with you guys in this live show and this is an interactive lesson so i need you to cooperate to tell me moves to try to figure out the solutions that's what it's all about that's why it's not a video yeah be because of queen takes d4 we shouldn't go rook h3 
very good and here well, actually it's already black who is winning just one mistake and that position can collapse because after queen takes d4 everything is hanging the knight on e5 because of the pin on the fourth rank and if that is hanging then the c4 bishop is hanging the f4 bishop cannot go away so we are lost please 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 be very careful with the attack that's why the isolated pawn topic is not that easy because we wish we could have all the pieces on the king side we wish we could always swing the rook over to h3 but sometimes it doesn't work so make sure before you make such moves that it's gonna work out well for you don't give up the d4 pawn if you are not giving mate or winning material in this case white is suddenly lost and that's really bad news that's why Erwin Lamy, of course, didn't go rook h3. Instead, he played h4. And I think my arrow is quite, yeah, quite obvious <laughs> that I'm pointing at h4, h5. He wants to push h5 and weaken black's king. We want to hit on this g6 square. This is where we would sacrifice normally after if we had the bishop on d3 but we don't have the bishop on d3 we don't have the rook on h3 but after h4 h5 we're gonna weaken this square the g6 pawn and then we could bring the rook to the h5 we could bring the bishop to d3 and win the game that's that's his plan actually so after h4 the game went on with knight a5 and now bishop b5 of course we don't want to give up that bishop i think i said that in every session about the eyes of his pawn that we never want to exchange that bishop for anything unless you win a queen or maybe an exchange with it don't give up that bishop this is the bishop that will win the game in many positions we need that bishop to hit on h4 h4 h7 on g6 on f7 on all those squares around the king we badly need this attacking piece so don't give up your light square bishop if you need to give up a bishop give up the dark square bishop but don't give up the light squared bishop that's one of the most important if not important one of the most important if not the most important piece in this position so keep it keep it on the board the queen d5 of course, once again, we are moving that bishop away. Doesn't matter if it takes a few moves, but we're gonna bring this bishop to some other square like bishop c2. Simply, we will not exchange it. That's the point. And after knight c4, uh, black would love to exchange pieces or win pieces. So now, because of this d3 rook, he's threatening to capture on e5, and that rook would be hanging on d3. So queen g3 is a very good move it protects the rook on d3 so knight e5 is not an option anymore for black if knight takes e5 we capture with the pawn and we are winning a piece because the queen and the bishop are hanging at the same time so black has to do something he played rook d8 once again playing for this pin now the rook will be hanging once again on d3 because now it's the queen and the rook on the d5 but Erwin had it all planned because this move, queen g3, was not only to defend the rook on d3, but he also freed a very important square for his knight, and that's the g4 square. Knight g4 is a very annoying move because black doesn't want to give up the dark squared bishop. If you push g6, it means that you have this fianchetto structure on the king side, and you need the dark squared bishop to defend the dark square squares why is it so difficult for me to pronounce dark squares anyway the dark squares so black cannot give up this bishop he needs this bishop to protect the king he has to move this bishop he went bishop e7 and now now that that bishop has left the f5 rook f3 and step by step but we managed to bring those pieces to the king side what about Queen d4, let's say. What can we do here with white? Why are we giving up the d4 pawn? Is there something going on? First of all, we should detect the weakness in black's camp, and I already hinted on the dark squares, if I can pronounce dark squares, dark squares, dark squares. After g6, the dark squares are weak, and the, the piece that protects these pieces, 
the fifth what am i saying i don't know what's happening to me today my speaking skills are not at its best so if the dark squares are weak we want to make them even weaker which one is the piece that is protecting them well it's the dark square bishop what can we do with the dark square bishop let's see Yes, there is already sacrifice. a sacrifice. You guys were saying that today I would need miss tactics. Yes, there are a lot of tactics going on. Unfortunately, you cannot really divide strategy and tactics because you need to know the right strategy, the right plans and ideas, and then you have to calculate precisely and carry them out. So actually, strategy and tactics go hand in hand. And that's why when we learn about middle games, we need to learn about both. So there are two ways to win here. One is the positional way, and that's what I was talking about because I usually make positional moves. I like to weaken the opponent's squares. I like to create holes in his position. And there's also a more aggressive way of winning this position with sacrifices. So one of these moves is the move that I would love to play, and the other is what Sofiko would play. So I would go bishop g5 here because I just want to see those holes in black's position. The dark squares are weak after g6. I want to swap this bishop. I want to exchange his e7 bishop. And after bishop g5, h g5, look at those holes. <laughs> I can jump to f6 with my knight. I can jump to h6 with the knight. The f7 pawn will be hanging. There's no defender. Black cannot do anything. So this position is just winning. I don't even know if uh, I will try to make a move. Let's say knight d6, just to try to protect the f7 square, to demonstrate how powerful this position is. After knight a6, king g7, you can play moves like, I don't know, rook d1, for instance. There's so many good moves. All you want is to play for the dark square. So I just wanted to have my knight on h6, the rook on f3, and the queen will come to e5. So the, this queen, the black queen, has to defend the dark squares. If he goes queen c5, then it's already, there are already tactics everywhere. So we eliminate the defender and now we're going to capture on f7. Too bad. That's too bad. Oh, oh, oh. Look at this mate. I love it. But it's all because we weakened the dark squares. We played bishop g5. That's a move I love. So let's go back to the position. After queen e4, you can either play the positional way. You're still playing for a mate. But first you eliminate the piece that protects the dark squares. You play bishop g5. You want the bishop to leave the board. And after bishop g5, h takes g5. You have either knight f6 or knight a6. Okay, probably knight a6 because they want to capture on f7. But anyway, those are huge holes in black's position. That's the positional way of understanding this type of position. And the other was queen takes d4 and knight h6, not bishop g5, that's my move. But Sopiko would play knight h6 here, and after king, h, king g7, knight takes f7, and everything collapses because of this sacrifice. Of course, if this is taken, then it's already very bad news, and we will win the queen with either bishop e5 or bishop e3. So black cannot capture the knight, black has to do something else. But any move like rook f8, will lead to some material loss like bishop h6 check so perhaps most of you will prefer knight h6 and knight takes f7 but i still like this positional move bishop g5 i think it depends on the style let me know which one you like more which way of winning you prefer the point is that we are winning whether with bishop g5 or knight h6 and knight takes f7 and therefore black cannot capture on b4 so after rook f3, it's quite problematic already. There's so many pieces on the king side. We can go knight h6, capture on f7. There are so many threats. Probably the best move here for black was f6. Because he, he has to try to keep everything there protected. Not to get into this knight h6, knight takes f7 sacrifice. f6 is good for that. f6 also defends some of the dark squares. So this was probably the best defending move, but it's not so easy to defend in a position like this. It's already 
quite unpleasant. So I understand when uh, Samuel thought that he has to break out. He has to give back, give back the pawn. Remember that he's a pawn up. So he's giving back his pawn advantage in order to open the bishop's diagonal and develop quickly. The problem is that even after e5, knight e5, bishop e6, yes, he almost made it. He almost developed all his pieces. The rook is still missing, but anyway, most of the black pieces are developed. But the problem is that the king will still be in trouble. So it doesn't matter that he managed to develop his pieces. In this position, we're going to still attack. And you already know where is the square, where we want to hit on black's position. If not f7, because in this position, f7 is very well protected. What other square could be our target? H5, of course. We played H4 like several moves before, but anyway, we always had something to do. But finally, it makes sense. Finally, we play H5, H5, and we are threatening H takes G6, and then Knight takes G6. The position would collapse. Black has to do something. He went knight takes e5. Um, actually, we can check. Like, what if he doesn't care about the threat? What if he just wants to finish development? After rook ac8, of course, we cannot just sacrifice everything on g6. Knight takes g6. It has to be captured. If not, it's knight e7. So this is going to be made anyway with checks all the time. Rook g3 now and queen g7 mate. Look how useful that bishop is on a4. Suddenly it's playing, suddenly it has something to do. Told you that it's gonna have a very important role in the attack. I think I have told you. So that bishop is something that we will never exchange. It's helping us even from a4. So h5 is something that black has to take into serious account. He cannot just let us capture on g6 and win the game. He has to eliminate this knight on e5. So at least there will be no knight takes g6. But after bishop e5, well, we will still capture on g6. And the bishop on e5 is so annoying. So black once again wants to exchange pieces. You know that when you are defending, you want to exchange pieces. The less pieces the opponent has, the less likely that you get mated. So it's very good what black is doing. Very instructive, but he's not on time even though he has managed to exchange already two minor pieces and he has he has developed his pieces. Now he's threatening to exchange the e5 bishop too. It doesn't matter, it doesn't help, unfortunately for him, because the position is just so bad that black is not on time. White will have the initiative all the time, even after exchanging so many pieces. Just look at this position after bishop b3. If the queen moves, and that would be very logical. The queen is hanging on d5. We have to move it, right? So if the queen moves, now you gotta find this move because this is probably the most beautiful move that you will see in this session, in today's session. So please find the winning move in this position. This is a beautiful move. I love this move. I wish I could win all my games with the moves like this. What? is the winning move here and i'm already opening other windows because i told you i'm so clumsy i'm clicking here and there what is the winning move in this position it's a beautiful move it is such a beautiful move and you guys are so quick and you are all saying it thank you it's the most beautiful move um not i have ever seen i would say in my whole career but one of the most beautiful moves for sure. It's such a pretty mate. We, we're gonna play queen takes g6, sacrificing the queen. And after f takes bishop e6. And now look at those bishops. Look how they coordinate. One bishop takes away the g8 square, the other the g7 square, and the rook is mate on the h5. That is that we are missing our queen. We have sacrificed the most powerful attacking piece and we are still giving mate because in this position, in the moment of sacrificing a queen, black just doesn't have any pieces protecting his king. All we needed is some kind of a way to give check on e6 and that's why we sacrificed the queen. 
we're gonna deflect the pawn from f7 that was protecting the e6 bishop and after bishop e6 it's made on a3 rook h3 I love this move. I think it's an extremely beautiful move. Queen takes g6. So I hope that at least this is like a highlight you will remember from the session. I love this move. That's why after bishop b3, black cannot move the queen. If he cannot move the queen, he has to do something like a counterattack. You don't want to lose your queen, but you cannot move it. So what can black do? He has to play bishop takes e5. So now both queens are hanging. Do we want to exchange queens? I hope that you're gonna all say shout right with capital letter that we do we want to exchange queens? Um do we want to exchange queens? There's this delay that I have to wait between the moment I say it and the moment you can hear it. So I'm sure that you're gonna say immediately, no, we don't want to exchange queens. Ever we are attacking, we will not exchange queens. Very good. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for writing it with a capital letter. Never, no, ever exchange queens when you want to give mate. You can sacrifice it in positions like the previous one, queen takes g6, but we will never just simply exchange queens and forget about our mating attack. Doesn't matter that black has managed to exchange three minor pieces. We will still attack after d takes e5, the queen is hanging on d5, so black now really has to do something about the queen. It's true that we don't have this beautiful queen takes g6 move anymore, that's a pity. But the position is winning anyway, even after exchanging on e6, we have to, we have to eliminate this bishop in order to make those pawns weaker on the king side. After rook f6, this position is just simply winning for white even if it looks safe it looks like f the f7 and g6 pawns are protecting black's king but it's just an illusion it's not true queen e7 the queen is there close to the king and we cannot play rook takes g6 because if we sacrifice that rook we will only have one queen left and with one piece you cannot give mate so let's not sacrifice here the rook but i want you to find a move that is just a move no sacrifice, no check, nothing like that. But if after that move, white will have a huge threat. And that move is the best move, the best attacking move in this position. Who can find it? So who can find the best move here? Let's see, let's see, let's see. I think you guys found the right idea, but you also need to make sure that you carry it out properly. I see that you want to play queen h4 because you want to threaten rook takes g6, winning the queen, or at least winning the pawn or mate, whichever black chooses. So after rook, after queen h4, rook takes g6 would threaten the e7 queen and give a check so it's a horribly big threat but queen h4 forgets about something let's not forget about that we don't want the black queen move away from e7 especially not by not by capturing our pawn on e5 we do need that pawn if we want to threaten e6 we need to keep that pawn so what's the way of preparing the same threat rook takes g6 and the threat of e6 very good very good guys it's queen g5 so the idea was correct that you were saying but you need to compare the options that's why it's very recommended that you say that okay which are the candidate moves which are the moves that will protect my rook and threaten rook takes g6 and e6 queen h4 and queen g5 then you compare these two moves and you realize that queen g5 is much better because it not only threatens rook takes g6 and e6, it also protects the e5 pawn. And we don't want to lose that pawn. It's the pawn that we want to advance. We need that pawn. So queen c5 is a way to pin that pawn and avoid e6. If black didn't do that but played rook e8, just simply protecting the queen, of course the move we would play is e6. 
because that was the other threat. We had two threats. It's very difficult to prevent both after e6, f takes e6, rook g6, king h8, and now after queen e5 check, that's a very nasty check because the king has to go to h7, and now queen h5 is a mate. Okay, of course, there are more ways to win. You can give check first here, but then it's somewhat longer because the queen protects. Then you go e5. Anyway, it's going to be a mate. The point was not this in how many moves we give mate. It's good enough. Mate in three, mate in four. You don't have to give mate in two. If if it's all with checks, I accept this mate as well, of course. The point was this e6 push because thanks to e6, we can break through. We can break the defense of black we can capture on g6 and then with no pawns on the g5 and the h5 black's king will be mated he cannot hide anywhere so this is just a beautiful demonstration of how important it is to have pawns in front of your king and how bad it is when the opponent man manages to exchange those pawns sacrifice pieces for those pawns somehow eliminate those pawns that's when we get mated so this is a huge threat after queen g5, either rook g6 or e6, and that's why Sevian played queen c5. But here, uh, there's actually already a very, very much winning move. Erwin, Erwin played another one. Erwin played rook c1, which of course we can understand he's bringing the last piece into the game with a tempo. That's what I was telling you all the time, that if you can bring more pieces to the attack, with a tempo, with a big threat, do it. Have as many pieces as possible, playing, being active, attacking. But actually, instead of rook c1, there was already an even stronger move, a move that would have won the game on the spot, which is... Rook takes f7, very good. After rook f7, I'm afraid that black has no moves. If king f7, we are winning the queen. e6, the queen is hanging on c5. And if he doesn't capture the rook, uh, what can he do? We are threatening queen takes g6, so there are not many options for black. He can try something like, I don't know, to play with black here. It's horrible. Queen c6, but anyway, we go back with the rook and then we will capture on g6. So rook takes, rook takes f7 would have won the game immediately. But even after rook c1, of course, it's still a very good move. White is winning. He chose a different way of winning the game. He chose to sacrifice not on f7, but on g6, which also wins because he has now this very strong passed pawn, threatening mating one on f7. And if the king tried to escape, then queen f7, king d6, and e7. Once again, there are so many threats. This pawn is about to be promoted, but the problem is the king on d6. Like, who has seen a king on d6? The king is supposed to be either on the king's side or on the queen's side, but it's just trying to flee from the king's side. Anyway, it will not make it. It might get to the queen's side after some checks, but it will not help because in this position, we are threatening Queen takes e8 and also queen d8 check. It's mate no matter what. And if rook takes e7, queen e7, a6, this is what happened in the game. After rook d8, queen e3, black resigned. He has no moves. If he goes b6, then it's mate, of course, with queen e7. And if instead, if he plays queen b6, then after rook takes a8, he has lost the queen. I see that some of you are saying that this is not about the isolated pawn, it's about attack. It's the same in this case because it was an isolated pawn position. Let's see what we should learn from this game. So we go back to the moment where we have a pawn down with white, but very active pieces. We have a lot of initiative for the pawn. There's our isolated pawn on d4, and thanks to it, we have the e5 square for the knight. Very active pieces, more space. After rook d3, we're going to transfer that rook to the king's side. We're going to play rook a3 if we can. And since the opponent avoided it, well, we are learning now this h4, h5 push. Just to break the defense, try to weaken those pawns, and then sacrifice on g6 and give mate to the opponent. So, yes, it's a demonstration of attack in one way, but 
On the other hand, it's the way how you should play when you have an eyes on phone. When you are playing with your eyes on the phone, you don't want to go and exchange pieces. You don't want to play an end game. So you better give mate and you better learn about how to attack with the eyes on the phone. And that's why we saw this game. I hope you liked it. I hope you learned from it. And we should already start talking about our today's topic, which I think we will see it in two parts because since we had this model game from the Tata Steel Chess Tournament, we will not be able to finish everything today. The topic is, the new topic is the breakthrough with f5. You know that sometimes you can get breakthrough with d5. You know that you should transfer your rook and the queen to the king side. So those are the previous topics we learned about the isolated pawn. And now we will see that sometimes you can also play for breaking through with the f pawn. And this is an old game, but Vinik Widmar from 1936, actually, a classic. Maybe some of you know it. But it's very instructive, so I wanted to show this game to you, which is a kid. Queen's Gambit declined. And after these initial moves, we don't really care about the opening. We have seen this position sometimes. This is important already. I said it in a previous session that whenever our bishop is attacked, of course we move it. First of all, we move it. Secondly, you might think that you want to go d3 to bishop d3 immediately because that's the diagonal where you want to attack. Yeah, but for that we need bishop c2 and queen d3. The bishop on d3 in itself will not give me. So when you have the chance of moving the bishop either to d3 or to b3, choose b3 because you will go to c2 anyway if you want to build up this queen bishop battery with queen d3, bishop c2, but at the same time, you are controlling the d5 square. So in some positions, you have d5. Sometimes you can break through with d5, and simply, you have the d3 square already for your queen. So you don't need to go bishop d3 just because that's the diagonal where you want to have a queen bishop battery. Keep it on b3, because like this, you connect it with other plans. You connect it with the plan of the d5 breakthrough and you will connect it with the idea of the f5 breakthrough that's something that we will learn right now after bishop d7 bishop d7 sorry i cannot speak today queen d3 knight bd5 we go of course always knight e5 and of course always we don't care about this bishop on c6 we don't want to capture it it seems like after knight takes c6, b, b takes c6, this pawn is weak, but we don't care because, first of all, it's not so weak. It protects the d5 square and it can be advanced to c5. So it's not a bad pawn. And the other thing, where's our knight from e5? Like, that was such a strong piece. We don't want to exchange it, especially not by moving it, capturing deliberately on c6. If you want, let your opponent capture on e5 and then at least our pawns will be connected but don't move that knight away don't capture on c6 it's much better to have this beautiful knight on e5 bring more priests to the attack the rook to the d5 almost always because we have this d4 pawn it's a weakness we need to protect this pawn we will not just give it up so we protect the pawn and after knight b4 queen h3 that's a queen lift the queen has already arrived has already made it to the king side and if black goes rook e8, very stupid move, I know, it's a stupid move, but I just want you to realize that the position can be so dangerous after so few moves. Queen h3, the bishop on b3, knight on e5, and this is always the moment when you should realize that there is a sacrifice on... a sacrifice on... Now the awkward silence until you hear my message. Where can we sacrifice? I'll have a tea. So it's, it's why the move and rook e8 was just a blunder. It would be a losing move because we have... Very good. Knight takes f7. And it cannot be captured. If king e7... King e7. King f7. I really don't know what's going on with me today. I'm sorry. Queen e6. And, well, king f8 would have been made, but even king g6 doesn't help at all because of these checks. Look at it. I don't ask you to calculate it all because it's, well, it's not so easy, but it's always checks. 
And in this position, there's a very funny move <laughs> because you would expect that we always have to give checks, but actually the queen doesn't really have any useful checks. We are always giving the same checks and uh, we would like to have more pieces that attack. This knight on g4 is a bit annoying because it protects the a6 square. So what we can do is to play f3. And it is funny, at least to me, because it's just the pawn move. We have sacrificed quite a lot of material and then we play f3, like seriously? Yes, we do, because we want to open the f file. So if we capture on g4, we are winning. And if the knight moves away, we are also winning. So f3 is a very good move. We are threatening to bring the rook into play. The f1 rook will give a check if the knight doesn't move. And if the knight moves, then we have this check that we wanted on h6. And after king f5, it's already a mating one. Now that was a long variation. I didn't want you to calculate it all. Simply, you just needed to see that after rook e8, we are already winning. We have already made 15 moves. This is how dangerous the position can be when you have an isolated pawn and the opponent doesn't know how to play. So knight takes f7 and after king f7, queen e6. And we don't care that, bishop, that uh, we have sacrificed the knight and now the bishop is standing on g5. No, because the king is just running around in the middle of the king's side. So cannot hide anywhere. We sacrifice once again with g4. To capture on a7, we check. And then this f3 move was checked. Yeah, I think it's funny. <laughs> so this is how black should not play. After queen h3, of course, nobody, at, at, least, at least I think nobody will play rook e8. Maybe we can, we can try. Anyway, we will go to h3 with the queen. So it's not that we are playing for a trick. It's not that you are praying to see your opponent play rook e8. No, the queen belongs to h3, to h5, to h4 to g4, depending on where the opponent's pieces are. You want the queen on the king's side. So mission accomplished. The first step of our goal has been achieved. Doesn't matter if the opponent doesn't blunder. Then we will play on, we will attack still. Here, a good move for black is bishop d5, and that's what Widmar played against both winning. What shall we do? Once again, I will ask, and if somebody says, if somebody doesn't get it right, uh, you're out of my classroom. I'm sorry, but do we exchange this light squared bishop? Do we exchange our b3 bishop? This is, I think, the most important thing that I want you to get from these sessions. Do we ever exchange the b3 bishop or the c2 bishop or the d3 bishop, the light squared bishop? Do we ever exchange it? No, never. Thank you once again for writing it with capital letters. Never, ever, ever, never, never exchange that bishop. So yeah, we will, we will not exchange it. We can either move it, uh, for instance, bishop a4, like in uh, the game of Erwin Lamy, bishop a4 was a good move in that case. And here too, the bishop would be useful on a4. Let me show you. Black could go a6. He wants to play b5 and trap our bishop or force it to, to go back to b3, exchange it. But after bishop f6, 97, black is already losing material. Like if rook e8, that rook will be hanging on e8 thanks to this bishop on a4. And yes, you can capture a rook with that bishop or you can capture the opponent's queen or you can give it up for a mate attack, but never ever just a simple exchange. Uh, after bishop d5, after bishop d5, we either go bishop a4 or what Botvinnik played, knight takes d5 because yes, we want to keep the bishop, but he just thought that okay, I will eliminate this bishop. It was quite a strong bishop for black on d5. It was protecting the e6 square. It was both attacking and defending both on the king side and on the queen side. It was a useful piece, so let's eliminate it. You don't want the opponent to have good pieces. You want him to have just bad pieces. You want to have good pieces and the opponent bad pieces. So we exchange this bishop. And here, actually, black made a mistake already because he should have tried knight f3. 
takes d5. What's the point? The point is that he wants to trade pieces. And after capturing on d5 with the f knight, now he will trade the bishops too. And still, white's position is better, I believe. I would prefer white here. But at least he has managed to exchange some pieces. What happens in the game is not that good for black because after capturing on d5 with the b knight, now is the moment to make this move that is our topic today. Breaking through with f5. And if you want to break through with f5, first you need to push the pawn to f4. And this is what we are doing. f4 supports the knight on e5. We have seen this move in other positions like Kasparov's game in the, uh, with the hanging pawns topic. So it's not like a new move to you. I told you that the hanging pawn structure and the eyes of the pawn have a lot in common. Also, they can transpose to each other. So it's good to know about both. But after f4, we not only protect the e5 knight, but we want to go f5. We want to push f5. Let's see why we want to play f5. What will change in the position after pushing f5? e takes, rook takes. And now, please, for a moment, think about what has happened, because the pawn structure has changed. There used to be a black pawn on e6, and there used to be a white pawn on f4. Now they are gone. We've exchanged those pawns, and thanks to this exchange, the position has changed. What have we achieved with the exchange of these pawns? Yes, Eric, you are right that it's important to remember ideas because every game is different, every position is different. But if we know the patterns, then we can find the right move in our game because we know that they are based on similar ideas. So yes, that's why we are learning uh, these ideas in these sessions. Thank you for pointing it out. This is actually the objective of this show, this interactive lesson. I hope that all of you believe that we are learning very useful patterns, patterns that you can apply in your own games. That's the point. And by the way, whenever you have a game, hanging pawns, eyes on the pawns, any motive that you have learned from me, please message me on Chess24. I'm very proud of my pupils and I would love to see your winning games, especially if you are applying something that you have learned from this course. So message me on Chess24. Yes, the F file has opened up and the D5 knight is weaker. These are the two main things that has happened to the position. So yeah, the F file has opened up. That's pretty bad for black because we already have a rook on F5 and we can double rooks on the F file. Also, since the E6 pawn is missing, this D5 knight is not that supported anymore. And if there's no pawn on E6, that means that our isolated pawn has suddenly become a passed pawn. Yes. In this position, it's not very likely that we're going to win because we have a passed pawn. It's very, very blocked. So we can't push d5, but still, it's a passed pawn. It's cool to say it. We have a passed pawn. Um, yeah, we will not win in an endgame. We will give me. That's what we want. We want to put a lot of pressure on the f file and also on this d5 knight. Let's see how. After queen d6, Actually, there's no more need to prepare anything. White is already winning. You need to find how. And I better call his tactics again. Let's sacrifice. So where shall we sacrifice? What's the idea? Rook f1 is a good move, but here in this position, white can already win by sacrificing. So we just need to find where can we sacrifice, what's going to be hanging. This is a temporary sacrifice. So we will make a temporary piece sacrifice in order to win them back later on and have the opponent's rook pinned. Yes, it's on f7. So the move is knight takes f7. I know that for some of you this is difficult, but 
Let's try to understand it together why this move works. It works because after rook takes f7, this knight on d5, this rook on f7, the king on d8, it's all in the same diagonal. They're going to be pinned. Also, we should point out that the c8 rook will be hanging in many lines. So after rook takes f7, these are the changes that happen to the position. And if we just play, what's the move that will make the d5 knight even weaker? We will not capture on d5 because we need this bishop. This bishop will pin the rook. So we want to make the d5 knight lose its support. The queen is protecting it and the f6 knight. So if we eliminate the f6 knight, that means that we will win either the d5 knight or if he plays knight takes f6, then we are winning in many different ways. We can capture on f7 immediately or after rook f6, the rook on f7 and the rook on c8 are both hanging. So after bishop f6, black has to give up the piece, has to give back the piece. Bishop f6 and rook d5. So we have recovered the material that we sacrificed. In this position, after queen d6, we give up the knight on f7 in order to capture on f6 later on, pin everything on the a2 g8 diagonal and win back the piece first. And after queen c6, how can we take advantage of this c8 almost hanging rook? The queen is defending this rook, so the queen many times can be overloaded. Uh, you are asking uh, SD Bates, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your account name very well, uh, how long would it take for a GM to find this move? Um, I don't know, five seconds maybe? <laughs> I should call some of my GM friends and ask them how much time would it take for them to find the move. Um, the point is that when you see the motives that the bishop on b3 will be pinning everything on that diagonal, the d5 knight will be hanging, the c8 rook will be hanging in many lines, then you just need to put together the puzzle. So you see these patterns and then you find the move that makes everything happen. You want to open the diagonal, you want the d5 knight uh, be hanging, and that was the way to do it. So here we have rook d6, very good. The queen cannot capture it because the rook will be hanging on c8. So Widmar went queen e8, and now one last move. Actually, I think I will not even ask because rook d7 is not a difficult move to spot. I'm sure that most of you would have said it, if not everyone yeah let's say that everyone would have said rook d7 the f7 rook is pinned so we want to capture it and if a piece is pinned you should attack it not cap not we could capture it immediately but after rook d7 now we are just winning simply the whole rook so rook d7 we put even more pre pressure on that poor pinned piece and the opponent resigned i think it was a very nice game let me show you some of the critical moments from this game. Because we have a usual isolated pawn structure. After knight b6, remember, you don't want to go bishop d3 because even though that's a diagonal where you would normally want to have the bishop for the queen bishop battery, it's better to go to b3. Because in this way, you have you can build up the queen bishop battery queen d3 bishop c2 you can play for the d5 breakthrough and what we learned today you can play for the f5 breakthrough so we have a lot of ideas in this position and it's much more difficult for your opponent to defend if you have different ideas combining those ideas playing for one then for another and the opponent always has to pay attention to those threats so bishop b3 is a very good move and after bishop d7 queen d3 of course, the knight always go to e5 when you have isolated pawn. And we want to keep this knight. It's a cool piece. Don't trade it. You want to have a knight on e5. We just simply bring the rook to d1. It, it belongs to d1. And after knight b4, queen a3, it was already getting dangerous for black. He has to pay attention to these sacrifices in f7. 
so rookie eight would have been a horrible move. That's why he goes bishop d5. He wants to trade the bishop, but as you know, we never exchange that bishop. Ever, 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 never exchange that bishop. So we either go bishop a4 to keep the bishop, or we can we can capture on d5, but with the knight, because we need the bishop. Knight d5, and here knight takes bd5 was already not a very good move. Black should have tried to exchange pieces, some pieces at least, the bishop too. So knight d5, knight b takes d5 was played, and now the new plan that we have learned was this f5 breakthrough, which is of course always initiated by the f4 move, f4, f5. What we want is to open the f file, weaken the d5 square so that this knight won't be that protected. It's blocking our pawn, it's blocking the d4 pawn, which after f5 can become and will become a passed pawn. Yes, we are not really playing for an endgame, but anyway, that pawn will have a free route once the once ugh, once the knight leaves the d5 square so f5 has a lot of advantages you can only play for this idea if your e5 knight is not hanging so imagine if in this position there would be like how to place it okay i'll try to draw bishop here let's say queen there anyway more pieces knight here with some more pieces on the board not in this exact position, but I just want you to understand that you cannot always play for f5. Sometimes there will be pieces attacking your e5 knight. And that means that after f5, black will just simply capture on e5, win a pawn, exchange pieces. So it's not something that we can always do. If not, everyone would win its game, win their games by playing f4, f5. No, sometimes we play for the queen, bishop battery, bishop d3, bishop c2. Sometimes we can play for d5, the d5 breakthrough. Sometimes we will just bring the rook to h3 and give mate by playing queen h4 and then capturing the knight on f6. And sometimes we will play f4, f5. It always depends on the position, the exact position. So in this position, when our knight is not attacked by loads of pieces, only five, we can play f4, f5. And that will open the f5, weaken the d5 square. And after f5, this position is just so, so, so dangerous already that after queen d6, black was lost immediately with this beautiful sacrifice. Sacrifice, knight takes f7, rook takes, bishop takes. We eliminate the piece that defending the d5 knight. We cannot play knight takes f6 because then the rook is hanging on f7 and we also have rook takes f6 this is a beautiful move so in bishop f6 we have recovered the material and after queen c6 the queen was overloaded queen d6 uh, cannot be played because of queen takes c8 maybe this sacrifice wasn't easy for for you to find but if you understand the motives that this knight is going to be hanging this diagonal is so important if we can open the diagonal up for the bishop that's going to be very painful for black. So if you put together these pieces of the puzzle, then you can find moves like knight takes f7. And by practice, it's going to be easier. So train your tactical skills. Tactics trainer on chess 24 or puzzle books, anything. Solve, ta uh, ta <laughs> solve tactics, solve puzzles. I cannot speak today. That's horrible. When you have to speak for an hour and a half and you are like, you're not saying the words that you want to say. I think of a word and then I say something else. Anyway, I'll stop complaining because today, this was it. We have started this F4, F5 topic. We still have some games to see, but since I wanted to show you also this model game from the Tata Steel Chess Tournament, the challengers group, uh, we didn't have time to finish the F4, F5 push topic, the F5 breakthrough. So I will see you next Wednesday with the same topic but other different more modern model games on this topic and next wednesday also after this session which is from six to half past seven we will have a thematic tournament practicing everything that we have learned all the attacking plans that we have learned about the isolated bomb so next wednesday make sure that first of all we have 
a lesson at six. And then I think it will be from half past eight. Yeah, is it? Finish at half past seven. Yeah, I managed to do the maths. 730 plus one is 830. So from 830, we will have a thematic tournament next week. You always have a one hour break between the lesson and the thematic tournament because I can talk a lot and I can be annoying. So you need a break, you need to grab a snack, drink something, enjoy life, listen to music, read a book, talk to your friends, your family, anything that's uh, away from the screen because sometimes we are just too focused on the screen. It hurts the eyes sometimes. So stand up from the computer from time to time. Next week, that's what we're gonna do from six to 7.30 interactive lesson with me we finish with the isolated bone topic on how to play with the isolated bone and then later of course we will also learn how to play against the isolated bone but next wednesday we still practice this attacking plan the f5 breakthrough then we have a thematic tournament with my love commentary so make sure you are here on wednesday if you cannot watch it live then you will still have the chance to watch everything that we have seen on YouTube or on our shows page. So whether live on Wednesday or later on, but I hope that you will learn a lot from these games. I chose them especially for you, especially especially for this show. So I hope that you like the games I've selected. I try to select the most instructive games. I usually don't care about names, years, rating. Okay, that's not true because I always choose strong players, um, but I think that the most important is that you understand the patterns. This is what we are doing here. We are learning the most important, the most typical patterns to play with when you have an eyes at the phone. So I will see you next Wednesday. I hope you enjoyed this session. Have a lovely week and study more chess. Chess is fun. Bye-bye.